Eloisa, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Eloisa Griffo from the University of California, Riverside, who will tell us about symbolic powers, stable containments, and degree bounds. Okay, thank you. And thank you all for coming. It's so nice to see all your names. And uh, thank you so much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Um, and most importantly, thank you for organizing this seminar. I think uh, the past few months have uh, presented some new challenges um, for many of us. And it, it helps to have access to such great talks from our homes. And um, on a more personal level, it's uh, been a reminder of how the uh, Commuter of Algebra community is so supportive and so great to be a part of. So thank you for that. All right, now my talk is in part motivated by this question that I already wrote down, that I think is a very natural question. So if you hand me your favorite variety and projective space, I want to at least find bounds for the smallest degree of a homogeneous polynomial that vanishes at every point on your variety, maybe to a particular order. And so, um, first of all, I want to study this ideal of all the polynomials that vanish from my variety. So this homogeneous radical ideal. And um, one of the invariants I want to study today is something that I'll write as alpha. So in general, if you give me any homogeneous ideal I, alpha will be the minimum degree of some non-zero uh, polynomial in I. Okay. So I don't just want to find alpha of the ideal coming from my variety. I actually want to study alpha of some sub-ideals, those of the polynomials that vanish to a particular order. And so to talk about those polynomials, I have to talk about symbolic powers. And I should say um, the, the theory of symbolic powers uh, is interesting for many other reasons. It's something that arises naturally from the theory of primary decomposition. And it happens to match the polynomials we're searching for in this setting. But it's something we could talk about for many other reasons. So through my talk, um, my rings will be regular. Often there'll be polynomial rings over fields or power series rings over fields. Um, I'll say things that are true more generally, but this is really the setting that I care about. And my ideals will be radical. So actually let me write down um, the minimal, let me give names for the minimal primes of my ideal. So these are my minimal primes. And the n symbolic power of i, which is this ideal that I write as i symbolic n. So this is the ideal that I obtain when I do the following. I'm going to first look at the ordinary power, and I'm going to localize it at each one of these minimal primes, and then I'll contract back that to R. So do this over each prime. So here's what I actually did. I um, took the ordinary power, I wrote a primary decomposition for it. And that primary decomposition had one component coming from each minimal prime. That's what these components are, okay? Perhaps I found other components coming from embedded primes, but those components I ignored. So really I collected sort of the minimal part of the ordinary power. So if you want to write this in a maybe more uh, compact form, these are the elements that live in the power up to possibly multiplying by something that gets inverted when I localize. So something that is not in any of those minimal primes. Okay, And these really are the polynomials that we're searching for. So um, let me first talk about the case where I have a finite set of points. So maybe x is some finite set of points. And actually what I'm about to say makes sense uh, both in projective space or a fine space. So in either setting, the ideal corresponding to x, maybe I need a little bit more space. So the ideal corresponding to x, first of all, is of course the intersections of the ideals coming from each one of these points. And um, we'll see some properties of symbolic powers in a minute. So this will follow from what I'll say later. But let me just say for now that if I take the n symbolic power, 
it's actually the intersection of these powers. So think of this guy as being the polynomials that vanish to order n at the point p1. So these are the polynomials that vanish to order n at all my points. And this is something um, that's true more generally. I don't have to have a finite set of points for these symbolic powers to be these polynomials that we were searching for. So that's a classical result by Zariski and Nagata. And uh, this is a result that's true more generally than I'll write. So there's a version of this that makes sense more generally. But let me just write down what happens when I take an algebraically closed field and I take some radical ideal in a polynomial ring over a field. So uh, really I wanna talk about the affine version of this. So right now my I corresponds to some affine variety and the risk kind of got a theorem is sort of a higher order version of Nusselsatz. So Nusselsatz would say, hey, I is the ideal of all the polynomials that vanish at all the points in a variety. So um, in fact, the, so for each point in, let me write X, my corresponding variety, the ideal of polynomials that vanish at that point, um, this is what Nusselsatz tells me it looks like. And now to vanish to order n at each of these points is to be in the nth power of each one of them. And that's what the n symbolic power is. Okay, so these are the polynomials we were searching for. And let me write down some facts. Um, and I should say, I will be mixing some easy facts with some not so easy ones, because I want to condense, you know, things we want to remember about symbolic powers. And the things I'll write are true more generally, but since we're talking about, you know, in this setting, um, it might be easy to just think about them as polynomials that vanish to some order. So in particular, vanishing, vanishing to order one is just vanishing, okay? Um, second, if I vanish to order n plus one, then I also vanish to order n, okay? So, so far these are properties that look like the ordinary powers. And in fact, so, so far these are easy. The n symbolic power does contain the n star. Oh, so these are true for all n. Now, um, sometimes these are the same. So here's the first property that is not so um, obvious, that if I is a nice ideal, so if I define the complete intersection, so if it's generated by a regular sequence, then in fact, all symbolic powers are equal to the powers, okay? But big, 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 big warning. We are not talking about the theory of powers today. Otherwise our, our, our job would be much, much easier. So in general, even if you take a prime ideal, the symbolic powers don't have to be equal to the powers, okay? And in fact, this condition in four is not an if and only if, it's just a sufficient condition. And this maybe is a good point to say that computing symbolic powers in general is very difficult, even with a you know, nice, powerful computer. And deciding if, if you have equality, either for all n or for some n for a particular ideal can also be quite difficult. So, um, that's one of the reasons why our, our, our job of, you know, finding these bounds is, is, is hard. Okay. Um, I think there's a question about zero. Yeah, the convention on the zeroth power is that it's just the whole thing. Okay, great. Um, ha. Okay, some more properties. Um, so, this one is also an easy property to show that if you take something that vanishes to order A and you multiply by something that vanishes to order B, you get to something that vanishes to order A plus B for all A and B. So this is really the statement that this um, sequence of ideals um, is, is a graded family of ideals. So in particular, that tells me that I can define a graded object out of symbolic powers. So I can define something called the symbolic Riz algebra um, of I. 
And maybe you can already guess what it looks like, right? The symbolic Riz algebra is the graded object that in degree n has the n symbolic power. And another warning, unlike the ordinary powers or the ordinary Riz algebra, this does not have to be finally generated. So maybe with another exclamation point, can be or can be, cannot, can be not finally generated. So really here's what I'm saying. Um, for arbitrarily large orders, you might be finding an element in the n symbolic power who's unexpected, by which I mean who isn't coming from smaller symbolic powers. And so that's uh, one of the takeaways from that is, is that that's one reason why these are hard to study. So there was an example by Reese. Um, there was uh, Paul Roberts gave an example of a prime ideal in a regular ring that still had an infinitely generated symbolic Reese algebra. So even if your ideal is nice, you can still find you know, difficult behavior of symbolic powers. And um, there's lots of work by many people trying to understand when the symbolic Reese algebra is Navarian or not. There are sufficient conditions by Hinnicky, for example. Um, but I want to talk about an ex I want to give you an example of a specific class, maybe to illustrate um, how innocent looking ideals might have bad symbolic powers. A class that actually received lots and lots of attention in the 80s and 90s. So there's many papers written about this uh, class alone. So many of you maybe are guessing what I'm talking about. So if you choose your favorite ABC, and you think of the curve uh, t to the a, t to the b, to the c, and you think about this curve as determining some prime ideal in three variables. Uh-oh, I didn't leave myself enough space. So I'm thinking of the map that sends each variable to each of these powers. This determines some prime in my polynomial ring in three variables, or you can take the power series ring as well. This is a prime of high two in dimension three. So very simple sounding. Um, but Goto Nishida, Nishida and Watanabe gave examples of choices of ABCs for which the symbolic result was not in the variant. And then there, 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 there are many conditions that are known to guarantee, so choices of ABCs that would give you um, symbolic result was that are in the variant. So for example, results of Morales, uh, Kudkowski and many others in that, uh, towards saying that. So really, the symbolic results of this guy can be infinitely generated, or it can be generated in various different degrees. So it can be generated in degree, well, up to one, which happens on the symbolic powers, the powers, and in the setting that happens to be equivalent to having a complete intersection, they can be generated in degree up to two, they can be generated in degree up to three, they can be generated in degree up to four, and etc. So the point I'm trying to make is in this, among this simple seeming class, you will see all sorts of strange, bizarre behavior. And um, maybe I want to remember this for later. So if you if you were trying to test some property of symbolic powers um, and you were searching for strange behavior, maybe I would suggest um, you look, yes, infinitely generated does mean non Nazarian as a ring. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying choices of ABC. So choose different values for your numbers ABC. Sometimes it might be finitely generated, sometimes it might not be. Okay. All right, but I want to do an actual example. I want to actually compute something. And uh, we, we could have talked about the second symbolic power, for example, the 345 case. Um, the sometimes is very difficult. So um, to give you an actual theorem of when you, you have these, so there are papers actually describing precisely when each of these four cases at least happen that I know of. I can give you references later, but um, the sometimes is very hard to describe. So, so really what I'm trying to say is just among this class, completely describing you know, what choices give you what behavior is, is difficult. Okay, I hope I've answered all the questions that I've showed them so far. Sorry, I see them sometimes, but it's, all right, great. Actual example, let's compute something. So let's take the monomial ideal generated by x, y, x, z, 
and Y, Z over your favorite field, it actually doesn't matter. Uh, Louisa, there was one more question. Oh, yeah. I, 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 there was a question about what does it, did you get this one? What does, what does it depend on in this example right here? You know, different ABCs. Vary your ABCs. Okay. You'll get different behaviors. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a very exciting, fun story. So this is, the, this is one of the points where I want to make 10,000 comments and I only have 90 minutes. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to stop myself from continuing, but um, yeah, I, I'd love to tell you more about it. Maybe, maybe it's a tea room afterwards. All right, good. I'm gonna pause myself here um, and compute this example. So um, let me draw the picture on a fine space because the projective picture is not very exciting. And this is a picture I can draw, right? I have three, uh, three lines. So with a picture, I can actually see a primary decomposition for I. Here it is. And to compute symbolic power, so for example, if I want to compute the second symbolic power of this guy, um, these are my three minimal primes. What I'm actually going to do is for each of these primes, for this guy, for example, I'll take the second symbolic power of this guy and then intersect with the second symbolic power of this guy and intersect with the second symbolic power of this guy. Now, this prime is really nice. It's, a regular, it's generated by a regular sequence. So one of our properties is that actually it's just a power for this guy. So for each one of them, I take the powers and I intersect. That, that's not what happens in general, right? Just these are nice. And uh, well, I wish squares and intersections commuted, but they don't. So this is not the square of I. It does contain it, that was one of our properties, but it's actually strictly bigger. And one of the easiest reasons for that is actually a degree reason. See, here's an element, x, y, z, that you can check is in the second symbolic power, has degree three. Now, this can't be in the square because of its degree, because um, the minimal degree of the square of this ideal is actually four, because the minimal degree of i itself is two. So this is something you'll see often happening. You'll find elements in your symbolic powers that have strange and expected degrees, small ones. And one of our goals is maybe to give lower bounds on what those could be, okay? So um, I, I wish I, I could compute more examples. We will see some more examples later. But right now, I wanna actually talk a little bit about our problem, about finding lower bounds. And maybe I should emphasize there's only one of the problems I want to discuss today for the minimal degree of the n symbolic power. So I want to make a, a, a sequence of simple observations that we'll see later are actually extremely helpful to study this problem. So first, I want to remind you of a property, um, one of the many properties that we wrote down for symbolic powers was that they're a graded family of ideas. So that this is true for any A and B. Now this statement implies something about degrees. It says something in here, its minimum degree cannot be bigger. So, sorry, the minimum degree of something in here, actually let me write it down. The minimum degree of something in here must be smaller or equal than the minimum degree of something on the left side. The left side is a product, so the minimum degree there is just a sum of the two. So we just wrote some statement about an inequality in these guys. And this is really the statement that the sequence that for each n computes the minimum degree of the n symbolic power is subadditive. Now, um, if you have a subadditive sequence like this one, the fact about subadditive sequences that if you take your sequence you divide it by n for each n, the limit of that sequence exists. And not only does it exist, it is equal to the infimum of the same sequence. And um, maybe I should say nothing prevents that limit from being negative infinity in principle, but in our setting that doesn't happen, right? Because our numbers are all, they're all non-negative, right? Okay. So, 
This allows me to define a constant that's known as the Waldschmidt constant, We typically, um, there are different letters for this in the literature. I like calling it alpha hat because it's remembering that it's sort of coming from alpha, but it has sort of more information than alpha. So that's this limit. And throughout, I want to remember that limit is also an integer. That's going to be important for us. So um, let me make some simple observations. First of all, for every n, if I compute, uh, so this was something I wanted to give bounds on. For every n, this is at least n times alpha hat of phi, just from the fact that this is an infimum, okay? And so in particular, if I was searching for lower bounds on the minimum degrees of the symbolic powers, I really just need lower bounds on this alpha hat. So in the beginning, um, it might have sounded like the, the, one of the constants we really cared about was these alphas, but I'm going to shift my focus to just studying this one number instead. Because in a way, it contains all the information that I want. And we'll also see that sometimes, you know, all, having all this information together is going to allow us to say more than we would be expecting to, to say. Um, and another point I want to make is that because this is a limit, if I want to find these bounds, it's enough to study what happens when my uh, symbolic power takes a really high order, right? So in some sense, I can sort of ignore what happens for small values and focus on high ones. And that will be very helpful in the second half of my talk. Um, but for now, let me talk about a simpler idea, one that I sort of used already, which is um, if you know that your symbolic power is contained in some particular ideal J, then automatically this gives me a bound, right? It tells me that the minimum degree of the n symbolic power is at least a minimum degree of J. So my goal could be to find good J, okay? So here's what I mean. I wanna find a J that I both know contains some high symbolic power or a particular one I care about, but also whose degree I control. So whose ideals do I understand best? Well, I understand M, the maximum ideal. I understand I itself, I understand their powers. So one of the uh, problems you might study if you're searching for bounds is something known as the containment problem. It's a very simple question. It asks, or simple sounding question, it asks, when do I have a containment of this format? So you give me an i and a b, and I want to find the smallest symbolic power that's contained in there. Um, now, first of all, from what I just wrote here, if I have positive statements like this, they will give me bounds. But um, more importantly, this problem is interesting for several other reasons. So I want to shift away from our degree bounds for just a second. And I want to talk a little bit about the containment problem in general and tell you about some of the other reasons why it's interesting. Eloisa, uh, um, yeah. one quick question. Can alpha hat be irrational? I think I, I don't know of an example where it's irrational, but I see no reason why it can't be irrational. I know it's rational if you have, say, a square feet monomial ideal, because we know how to compute it. Um, Exactly, there's a nice paper telling you how to do it, but um, I don't know if anybody knows of an example where it's irrational, but I, I, I don't see any reason why it can't be. Okay, great. Um, any more questions? Okay, so um, I, I'm not sure what the questions are asking. Uh, there's another question, but um, the answer is no. I'll... Okay. All right. Okay. So let me tell you about some reasons why I find this an interesting question on its own, besides giving me lower bounds. First of all, you might remember earlier we said the symbolic power always contains the power. So if it happens that I can choose A and B to be the same number, 
then that will actually tell me that I have the quality for that particular value. So secretly, the containment problem um, hides as one of its sub-questions the equality problem as well. And if they're not equal, the containment problem is trying to compare them in some way. Okay, so um, I said I want to talk about uh, regular rings today. So let me tell you about some things we know in that setting. So now R is just some regular ring. It doesn't have to be a polynomial ring of a field. I should say it's excellent. I will be some um, radical ideal. So as before, I want to remember the names of the minimal primes of R. And it turns out that the um, containment problem is closely related to an invariant that throughout my talk will always be denoted H. So if I ever don't tell you what H means, it's this invariant. It's something called the big height. And the big height is a number that's very closely related to the height, but it's sort of more honest. So the hider could mention would ask, what's the height of each piece, each of the minimal components, and it would take the minimum. So instead, I'm going to take the max. So if you forget what this number is, just remember that for a prime ideal, it's just the height or the codimension, okay? So in this setting, there's a really beautiful answer to um, our containment problem, which was first proved by Ein, Lazarsfeld, and Smith over C using the theory of multiplier ideals. And then um, Hoxter and Hunicke extended the results um, to the case where the ring contains a field. So they use tight closure techniques to prove it in characteristic P, and then they use reduction to characteristic P to prove it over a field of characteristic zero. And that left the mixed characteristic case um, to be completed, and, and that's what Ma and Shui did recently. So they actually built the theory of multiplier ideals in mixed characteristic, and in a way, uh, once you have the right theory, you can sort of copy paste the I'm a Smith proof, and it's, it's the same idea. So I think that's, that's very cool. So here's what the theorem says. It says that if you want to find the symbolic power containing the nth power, you take your um, number n and you multiply it by this special invariant. OK, so my goal today is to talk about regular rings but I do want to take a quick uh, side break to talk a little bit about what happens more generally. So see, it's not clear that this question even has an answer, right? It's not clear that if you give me a B, I should be able to find an A. If for every B there is an A, that tells you that the two families, the symbolic powers and the ordinary powers are co-final with each other. And so they determine the same topologies. So back in the 80s, Chancellor has studied when does that happen. And um, building on Chancellor's work, so actually let me write this down. Um, look at Chancellor's work on when these are co-final. Um, so building on his work, Irena Swanson in the late 90s showed a really beautiful result that in, in great generality, if they are the final of each other, so if you can't answer the question, then there exists an H for which this containment is true for all n. So give me an I, I find an H, okay? But her theorem did not build the H, she said it existed. And so what these guys did was they showed that if your ring is regular, this is what H is, it's this number the big height. Now, the, the status of the problem in the singular case is, um, a lot more interesting. So there's, there's, there's uh, interesting open questions to be talked about. So I just want to say quickly, if you want to learn more about the singular uh, setting, um, you might look at the work of Hunicke, Katz, Validashti, or Robert Walker, um, or Kava Rojas, or Smokin, or many others. And in fact, uh, Craig Hunicke just gave a really nice sequence of talks in a seminar in India a few weeks ago. I believe those talks were, uh, were filmed and they, you can watch them online. And he talked about that singular problem. So if you're curious, I would recommend you, you go watch it. All right, so 
that was a side note. Let me go back to my actual problem. I want to talk about what happens for regular ones. So part one, I promised bounds on degrees. So what does this tell me about bounds on degrees? Uh, Eloisa, there's a question. Yeah. Is the H optimal? H. Let me answer that later. Okay. Um, you'll see that that uh, not quite, um, but let me, that, that's sort of what I'm going to answer next. Okay. All right. So first the consequence, and then I'll get to the question. If I apply degrees on both sides, so let's do a, a little bit of computations. I apply degrees on both sides, I get an inequality. And by the way, the minimum degree of the i to the nth power is just n times the minimum degree of i. So I take this, if I divide by hn on both sides, maybe you see where I'm going, and then I take a limit, what I get on the left side is that number alpha hat, okay? What I get on the right side is alpha of i divided by h, okay? So here's something really cool. I had information about a subsequence of my symbolic factors, not all of them, but now suddenly I have a lower bound that tells me something about every symbolic factor. So that's one of the magic um, facts of being able to study this limit number. And I should say that this, this bound that we just discovered had already been shown um, in the late 70s by Waldschmidt and Skoda. So, so far we've rediscovered bounds we already knew, but I hope this is at least proving to us that this is, a, this is an avenue to try to find bounds on these degrees. Now, is this, is this the best we can do? Let's look at examples. So that example we computed before, that monomial ideal, y and c, remember in your favorite fields? Well, this is a, an intersection of three primes of height two. So the h is actually two. So the theorem says that the two n symbolic power is contained in the nth power for all n. So for example, it says the fourth symbolic power is contained in the square. Well, we saw the second symbolic power is not in the square. Right, that was our computation. But actually, I claim it. If you get bored, this is maybe a fun exercise. You can check that the third symbolic power is contained in the square. Okay. So from the perspective of trying to answer the containment problem from a best possible perspective, finding the smallest a, this value hn is not the best possible. If you do want um, if you want to write a linear function like this, just like some constant times n, Bocci and Harborn did prove that you can find ideals for which this is the best integer constant. But as we're about to see, you might be able to improve this function in other forms, okay? So in particular, oh my God, not example, question. So um, in 2000, as when he heard first of the Anders Feldsmith work, Hunicke asked, if you take something very nice, so let's say you take a prime of height two in some regular local ring. Very nice setting. Could it be that at least the third symbolic power is always in the square, so better than the fourth? And years later, Harborn conjectured um, a generalization of this. And I should say, I think this is not as much a conjecture as a question. I think this is what I'm about to write is what I was at the, at the boundary of what was known. And he really wanted to know the answer to this question. Um, I think he might be in the chat, so he, he could tell you if I'm lying. Um, but I think, I think this was the, what we didn't know. So the theorem told us that the hn symbolic power was contained in the nth power for all n. And Harborn asked if we can always subtract H minus one, okay? So, um, well, he had good reasons to ask this question. So here's one reason. It's a fact, in fact, <laughs> it's uh, what's one of the key facts at the heart of the hoxter hunicke proof of this theorem is that when you're in characteristic P, if you take not any N, 
but a power of your characteristic, maybe let me call it Q. Then the HQ symbolic power is not just containing the Q's power, it's actually containing the Q's Frobenius power, which is a little small. So that's the ideal generated by the honest uh, Q's powers of things in I. And this is, this is one of my, uh, this is one of my favorite proofs because it's something you can actually do in a talk. It takes three or four minutes. I do, however, want to say many other things. So I'm just going to say this. Um, if you watch those, uh, those lectures from India uh, by Craig Hineke, he actually proved this in his talk. So you'll see how natural and, and beautiful it is. And this is, this is my personal favorite application of the pigeonhole principle. And if you apply the pigeonhole principle carefully and see exactly what it says, it does say you can subtract that h minus one and no better. So in a way, the, the linear function that, that Harbin proposed was the most natural one. But this doesn't give me the other values of n. It only gives me the powers of p. And one reason it cannot give me the other powers, um, so let me give you the bad news right away, is that Harbin's conjecture, the answer is no for particular i's and particular n's. So the first example, was found by Dumnitsky and Schomburg and Tatyka They found one example over C. And actually later, Harbon and Secheliano showed that you can extend their example over your favorite field of characteristic knot. So they show there exists some radical ideal in three variables. So let me say Q of X, Y, Z. So they, as I said, you can take any field of characteristic knot two. And this is an ideal of big high two. It's actually um, the original example. It's 12 points in P2 in some very special position. If you really want to, I can show you a picture later. I'm not going to try to draw it because I'm not very good at it, but I can show you a picture. Um, in fact, I could write down uh, the example, but the idea is, Harborn's conjecture would ask if the 2n symbolic power is always containing the nth power. And what these guys showed is that for this example, the third symbolic power is not in the square. So that's sort of the first step in Harborn's conjecture. But in fact, if you take any other value of n, if you take n at least three, it so happens the conjecture is true. And we'll get back to this in the, in the second half of the talk. But um, I should say this example um, has now been extended. There's various examples. But all of the known examples are very special in some sense. They all come from special configurations in PN of some kind. And um, I think one of the morals of the story is that nice ideals, yes, uh, you can build it. it. I could write it down. It just would take me. Um, maybe a little longer, but I could write it down and I could show you the picture. Okay. I was just trying to save time by not writing it. And now there's, there's various others, very, ex very explicit examples. You can check it by hand. Okay. But let me tell you, let me tell you this. So Harborn's conjecture was asking about this containment for all n. And this does hold for various classes of ideals. Oops. Um, so this holds for, um, let me tell you some examples. It holds if you take some general points in P2. That's a result of Boachi and Harborn. And it holds in P3. That's a result of Dumnitschke, so for general points. It also holds if you take nice things like square free monomial ideals. And it turns out that the case of square free monomial ideals is a subcase of a much larger class. So if you're in characteristic P, it's enough to ask that I defines a ring with very mild singularities. So this holds if R mod I is something called F pure. So this is a word that has appeared in some previous talks. Maybe the definition is not very important right now, so let me say it quickly. If you're essentially a finite type over a perfect field, this is asking that the Frobenius map B 
be a split map of our models. Okay. So this is a result by myself and Craig Hunicky. And actually, you can apply reduction to characteristic P and get a statement over a field of characteristic zero. So in characteristic zero, you need that R mod I be something called of dense F pure type, which essentially means um, when you go my P for most P's, you will get something of pure. Okay. So let me give you examples of things that are in here. Maybe of some singularities that have appeared in, in previous talks in this seminar. So um, an example is when I, R mod I is a Veronese ring. So it can be a Veronese uh, subring of a polynomial ring. It actually can be a Veronese subring of some other thing that's a pure. Um, you can take the case of generic determinantal rings. So if I is actually the T by T minors of your favorite generic matrix, so let me write gen, say, you know, my entries are all just different variables. So I'm in the ring where I added all the variables that were in my uh, matrix. This holds more generally if R mod I is the ring of invariance, essentially a nice ring of invariance. So if it's a ring of invariance of a linearly reductive group. So these are all types of singularities um, that maybe if you've been watching previous talks that have appeared before. And I should say, so square frame anomaly ideals are in this class. Um, but if you exclude them and you focus on the other nice singularities that are wrote down, they're actually, they're all better than F pure. They're actually all strongly F regular. In other words, we've maybe seen. I, I don't want so much that you, it's not so important to know the definition right now. It's just that to remember that this is something that means mild singularities. Okay, so Y is very nice in some sense. And again, the statement is that the Harbour's conjecture holds. And so if you're in this more general, um, sorry, this nicer setting, uh, Craig Hunicki and I also showed that you can do better than Harborn's conjecture. So you have the same statement as Harborn's conjecture, but you can actually take that value H and you can replace it by H minus one, okay? And maybe I should say, um, for this to make sense, H should be at least two. Um, and I should say the H equals one case is not interesting for us today because we're in regular rings. So the, the, the H equals one case is, is not interesting. The symbolic power is just the power there. So this is throughout, you should always assume I mean H equals at least two, okay? So when you replace H by H minus one, what I'm saying is I will behave as if it's a big height is one less. And one cool corollary is the case when H is two. So if you take H equals to two, you're going to replace H by one. So I'll give you a few seconds to look. So what you obtain is the quality of symbolic and ordinary powers, which holds for non-trivial reasons, okay? Um, and as a side note, if you're curious about the non-regular setting, um, there's, a, there's an extension of this result to some singular rings uh, by myself and Lynch Ma and Carl Schwieb. But all right, so so far we've learned the containment problem uh, might be interesting. There's some conjecture that isn't true in general, but it's true for nice ideals. And um, I think that means it's a great time to take a break. Uh, all right. Um, so let me start by reminding us, um, so let me write here, if R mod I strongly F regular, then can replace. Okay, all right. So my second half is actually two halves. I wanna talk about two separate projects. And the first one I should warn you does not have in principle anything to do with degree bounds. It's about the containment problem. But a um, um, little uh, uh, teaser, we will use ideas from the first project on the second one. And the second one is about degree bounds, okay? So um, we have this conjecture by Harborn, let me remind you, he was asking that if I take that statement from that nice uh, theorem we saw, he was asking if I can always subtract h minus one. And we saw that examples exist for particular ends, particular i's, where that's not true. 
But what we don't have counterexamples to is the version of Harborn's conjecture that we're calling the stable Harborn conjecture. So instead of asking that it's true for all n, I'm going to ask if it's true when n is large. Because see, when I gave that example, I said, oh, it fails when n is two, but then things are fine. And so in fact, um, let me tell you, for every counterexample of the original conjecture that I'm aware of, that's in the literature for everyone, I do know that the stable harbor conjecture is true. And I'll tell you how I know that in just a minute, right? But um, before I tell you that, let me just talk a little bit about how do you even go about studying something like this? Because I said before, the computing symbolic power is difficult and the higher the order, the, the harder the symbolic power is to compute. So one thing you might hope is if you're optimistic like me, is that it's enough, hopefully, to study some particular containers. And maybe that will be enough to give me large ones. So you may ask, is it enough to find a particular K, so one K, such that that containment that Harborn asked for is true for that K? So will that imply that stably I get the same containment? And I wish, that I knew that I could say yes, right? The answer, I would be done at least in characteristic P. So in characteristic P, we would be done. Because um, you might remember, I said in characteristic P, there are values where this holds. I already know that. So at least in characteristic P, the problem would be solved. Now, unfortunately, I don't know this yet. Um, I get a sense that there might be a question that I can't see. I forgot to try to open the questions. Even when P equals two, would it be okay then? Yeah, if P equals to two, the third symbolic power is in the square. Yeah, good question. Fantastic, for all P's, I can find you values. Yeah, very good question. Okay, but I don't know this, I wish I did. Here's the theorem I do know is true. Um, I do know that if you find a value where something a little stronger than Harborn's conjecture holds. So if for some K, I could delete that plus one. So this is slightly harder containment. Then I do get not only stable Harborn, but I get the same type of containment for all large values. Okay. So let me um, help you uh, process what I just said. Um, well, first of all, actually, maybe, maybe let me make a comment. Um, the method I used to prove this, I know for a fact, cannot be used with the, the statement of Harborn's conjecture. So it's not that I can't, is I could prove to you that I can't apply the method there, unfortunately. Um, okay. There's one more question. Does n big enough depend on k? Um, yes. So in this theorem here, you give me a k, then I take n to be at least h times k plus one, okay? And um, it's possible that it's true for all n bigger than k, but I don't know that. I can only prove, you know, after h times k. Okay? So my expectation is you find it once, and then you, maybe you go a little bit further, and then it starts being true for all n past that point. Good question. Now, um, on the other hand, I should also say, it might sound like my assumption is too strong. Because in fact, when Harbor first asked his question, he did know examples where he couldn't get this containment. So fix a K, he goes and finds an I where this is false. But what I'm proposing is you fix the I first, and I'm asking that you go and find the K for which this is true. And I don't know of any counterexamples to this. And again, I do know that counterexamples to the original conjecture satisfy this assumption. And in fact, I would go as far as suggesting an even more um, optimistic conjecture that maybe if you gave me your favorite constant, um, your favorite positive integer constant, that maybe you, if you go far away enough, maybe you can always subtract C from that HN. And I have some evidence that suggests this is not a crazy question. Now, um, I do know classes where this is satisfied. I do know classes where this was true. And there's different kinds of evidence we could discuss.
But I want to tell you about one particular avenue that you might follow to try to study this stable problem, which might explain um, how I'm making these, uh, these statements that I know about all these examples. And that's by studying an invariant known as a resurgence. It was something first defined by Bocci in a hard one. And uh, maybe I should point out there are many um, variations on the resurgence that appeared later. I'm only going to talk about the resurgence today, but you could make statements involving the other variations on the resurgence. So the resurgence we write it as rho of i, and it's a number that sort of studies the containment problem asymptotically in a way. So we're going to look at all the non-containments in the containment problem, and we're going to compare the two orders. Okay, take the quotient between them. And I'm gonna ask for the supremum of all these. So how bad can non-containments be, is the question. And um, I know some things about this number. It's a number, it exists. It's at least one, because um, I didn't point this out in the beginning, but it's actually an easy exercise to see that I can't have a positive containment if A is smaller than B, that's impossible. Now, I, Moses Feldsmith, Hoxer Huniki, Mashweed told me, this is at most H, because remember, oh, I don't know why it's called resurgence. That's a good question for the end, um, but I'm not sure. I, 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 if maybe if uh, Brian or Cristiano are around, they might have a good answer. That's a great question. Okay, so let me make a very simple remark that turns out to be uh, very, very useful. If you happen to know that the resurgence is anything other than H, any other value, then stable Harbon holds. And in fact, you might wonder, be wondering to yourself right now, well, but the containment problem is hard. Aren't we solving the containment problem completely? Well, um, we don't have to. So it turns out that you can often bound this number, the resurgence, using other invariants that do not involve compute particular containments. And sometimes you can even exactly compute the resurgence by maybe finding one or two containments are true or not. Yes, that's true. All values where it's known it's rational, as Brian is saying. And in fact, um, I mean, it, I see no reason why it can't be an irrational number, but it is rational if I is nice, as you might expect. So for example, um, ben Rapkin and Michael De Pasquale just posted a paper a few weeks ago where they show that, in fact, if the symbolic result is Neverian, then the number is rational. Okay, great questions, fantastic. So I'm only asking, the only information I'm asking about the resurgence is that it's not its maximum. And this is actually really easy to, to, to say. And so maybe the statements I was making before about known counterexample is because I know their resurgence and I'm actually using this. So in fact, if I do know the resurgence is less than H, I know better than stable carbon. I can answer that question, that, that potentially crazy sounding question that I asked before. So let's, let me say that you gave me your favorite C and your favorite ideal. We knew the resurgence was less than H and we wanted to find an end where this was true. What could I possibly do? Well, <laughs> I would get the containment for free if I happen to know that this number hn minus c, when I go compare it to n, if I knew that was bigger than the resurgence, right? Just reading the definition. But now this inequality I just wrote down is when I can solve. It's a very simple inequality, right? And I can solve it for n, c was given to me. So it's, it's, I'm being asked that c be at least H minus the resurgence. That's the requirement. The only thing I asked was that the denominator was not zero. So this is a number, maybe it's 5 million, I don't care. After that point, I have the containment I want, okay? So I think, uh, let me remind you, H is at least to, to uh, avoid uh, silly situations. But I think the question we should be asking is whether the resurgence can be and by the way, even if it is H, that doesn't say um, that the stable harbor is false, right? It just says, ah, maybe it's harder. But we have no examples of I's whose resurgence is equal to the big height. It's always smaller in cases where it's been computed. 
So in a joint project with Craig Kuniki and Vivek Mukunda, we've been essentially trying to show that the resurgence is always as we expect. We're calling it expected resurgence. So that is always strictly less than the big height. And maybe I should say, it could be as close to the big height as you want. Watching Harborn gave examples like that. But even if it's just a little epsilon below H, I'm good to solve this stable problem. So let me tell you um, about some of our results. So we give some sufficient conditions for the resurgence to be expected. And this is, a, I think, my favorite of those results. So again, with Craig Hineke and Vivek Mukunden, this is now a statement about either regular local rings, or R is a, maybe a polynomial ring of a field from the graded setting. M is that maximal ideal, the, the irredundant guy. And in that case, of course, I want I to be homogeneous. And our theorem needs an assumption about the symbolic powers. I need to assume that I happen to know that to compute the n-symbolic power, I have to take only saturation of the maximal ideal. So in case you've never seen this notation, let me write down what this means. And uh, this might sound technical if you haven't thought about it before, but all we're asking is that when you look at all your powers, the only possible embedded prime you'll find is the maximal ideal and nothing else. Um, and sorry, the answer to the question, is there a sequence of i's such that rho of i approaches h? Yes, it can be as close to h as you want. So that's their examples by Bocci and Harbon. But um, close is still good for me. Okay. All right, sorry. Um, ha, so I was saying, this assumption is, is not, um, too crazy. So for example, if I define a finite set of points in projective space, then this is a setting where you can apply this. If you have a prime ideal of having one less than the dimension, that's a setting where you can apply this, okay? So interesting things, I think, fall under this assumption. And before I write our theorem, let me write you what I wish the theorem was, because it might explain uh, where this is coming from. So I wish the statement was that we found a value where Harborn's uh, containment was true. And that that was enough to get expected resurgence. So then the resurgence of i would be strictly less than h. This is what I wish would show. We show something close. You assume you have this containment, but you also assume that this guy has no minimal generators of this power. So really that you can add a little m. And now, this theorem does have applications. So there are classes of i's for which I can actually find such a k, and then I'm done. Okay? So through these applications, I do need to assume I have this containment. So one thing I would, I would like to one day have is a version of this theorem that's more general. Uh, that doesn't make this assumption on the maximum. Okay, so one case where we could apply this is when you're in that graded case, you're over a field of characteristic zero, so i is homogeneous, and i is generated in degree smaller than the big height. So I'm asking for something of high co-dimension is small generated in degree, okay? So what we showed is in that setting, you can find a k where that containment is true, and once you found that k, you get expected. Another setting where we did this, uh, one where I don't need the assumption because it always holds, is those bad primes from the very beginning of my talk. So you remember I said, when you choose various ABCs and you look at, let me just say it like this, you look at the prime that defines this curve, um, I said that those guys have bad behaviors, right? You, say, you see very different types of symbolic algebras. So as long as your characteristic is anything but three, I, I don't know what happens in characteristic three. We just, our method doesn't apply there. But here's what we did. Well, first of all, years ago, I had shown that the third symbolic power of all of these guys is in the square. So the answer to Kunika's question is yes in this setting. So now we only needed to add the M. This is the, the dream, right? So we just need to check that the degrees of the things in here are kind of big, that they can't be 
minimal generators of p squared. And writing generators for the third symbolic power is difficult. I mean, especially because, you know, these guys have all sorts of behaviors. But there's a, a paper by Nodal, Schentel, and Zonzerov where they give implicit equations on the generators of the third symbolic power. You know, they have to consider different cases, but they, they, they completely describe what happens. And using their implicit equations, you can make estimates on the degrees of your uh, generators. And you can say that they're too big to just to be minimal generators of p squared. And so now we don't have to study more containments. We know stable carbon holds. Okay. So these two examples were in a, in all, this were all in the same paper. And now in a paper we're currently writing, so unfortunately we won't find this statement on the archive yet, um, is that if you're on characteristic p, if R mod I is Gorenstein, then we can find a K like this. Here's the bad news. The K depends on P. The K we're going to find is going to change with the characteristic. So now you wish you could take the statement and do reduction to characteristic P and get something in characteristic zero as well. But it's not suitable for doing that. However, we did find a workaround it and we did get a statement in characteristic zero. But I also need, um, I also need that the symbolic Riz algebra is Navirian in that setting. So finally generated, let me write it like this. Um, maybe we can re remove that assumption one day. All right, so that was the first project I wanted to talk about. And now um, for the rest of my talk, I wanna be back to degree bounds. And um, I've been talking for a while, so let me remind you of some of the things we said. We said that to give bounds on the degrees of all the symbolic powers, I just needed to study this Waldschmidt constant, this limit of all these guys, and that's also an infimum. Okay. Now, we also said, so from now on, I'm, I'm really over a polynomial ring of a field, okay, from everything else I'm going to say. But we've already discovered that we have this lower bound where I take alpha i divide by h, and that was actually a bound by Vatsmid and Skoda. Sorry, uh, these are separate papers, both from 77. Okay. So in particular, I'm actually going to be really interested in the case of finite sets of points from now on. So let me write that down. So if i, def means defines, s points in Pn, the bound is then that the alpha hat is at least alpha viver capital M. That's what the big hat is there. And um, this bound can be improved. So it's a theorem of Shudnovsky when N is two. And that's uh, 78, I think. And there was N extended for any N by no and vive, oops, uh -oh. that's from 1983. So they did the case of general n. And what they show is if, <laughs> let me cheat. If I defines S points in Pn, <laughs> they showed that the alpha hat is at least alpha by plus one over n. So they improved the bound by one over n one of the, you know, dimension of your projective state. So I should say, um, the in Owen v. Vec paper actually proves something stronger. They show that um, you can replace, essentially you can replace these by um, the minimal degrees of the M symbolic power for your favorite fixed M, but then you have to sort of adjust the denominator for them. Eloisa, there was a question. What's the motivation for dividing by the capital M? So you might remember in the beginning, I, I was saying, for me to know, ah, okay. So for me to know that this limit exists and that it's an infimum, I had to divide by the n. No, I, I think they mean by the capital N or the, or oh. the I'll, I'll let the person, oh yeah, never mind. There are different bounds. There, there's a, there's a, a, a bound by Nagata that would be a, an nth root of your number of points. I won't talk about that that bound today. But if you remember, 
I, for me, it's easier. I think about these things in terms of containments, really, that are stronger statements. But if you think about the containment, the way we deduce this from the containment, the H was the number that actually show up. So it's not H square or square root of N or something because, um, well, I guess in this setting, it, I couldn't write such a containment. Um, and I think the corresponding containment wouldn't even be true for certain ideals. But, but to, me, the, to me, the easier way to see this is coming from those containments. Um, maybe somebody has a better answer than me. But that's, that's a good question, I think. Um, ha, now. Okay. Uh, they, they just followed up on their question. There are cases when the limit is infinity. Okay. With dividing by the n. Okay. Uh, I'm just okay. Okay, so, so 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 they're suggesting maybe you should do n squared or something to make it not infinity. Well, this is at most alpha of i, right? This number that we're writing is if you. I think they're talking about in the limit. The ah, alpha of i divided by i. Okay. Hmm. Maybe this is a good thing to talk about afterwards. Okay. Then let me, let me move on. Maybe we'll come back to this later. So Shudnowsky, um conjecture, this is before the Noah and Vivek paper. So in the same paper where we proved this, he conjectured that maybe you can always do better. Let me say 1970. He conjectured that maybe the alpha hat is always at least alpha of i plus n minus one over capital N because this is what he proved when n is two, right? And maybe um, this is a good, a good moment for a, a quick uh, 30 second uh, comic relief, I guess, or, or interesting. You might be wondering who this Chernovsky is because I think there, there are several famous Chernovskys in math. So this is Gregory Chernovsky. He's a, known for, for many reasons. He's a famous mathematician. He's done a lot of work in number theory, for example. Um, I think in, in, in popular math circles, maybe he's best known um, for his work with his brother, um, David Chudnovsky. So the two of them have, uh, have these incredible algorithms for computing decimal cases of pi. So in the 80s and 90s, their algorithm uh, kept breaking records of you know, most decimal cases of pi ever computed. And it seems like Mathematica, if you ask it to you know, approximate pi to however many cases, it's going to use their algorithm. So that's the Chudnovsky that we're talking about. Okay. All right, so uh, this is a statement just about degrees. And maybe I should say, you know, these guys weren't talking about symbolic powers, right? You can describe what this number is without talking about symbolic powers, but I'm reinterpreting their statements um, in terms of symbolic powers. And as we've saw, we saw before that writing containment statements can lead you to containments like this. And so Harbon and Hunicke conjectured um, a containment that would imply this inequality. So really they were trying to study uh, Shudnovsky's conjecture from a perspective of containments. Um, I think this is 2011. And their conjecture is more general. It's not just for points. It's really for a radical ideal I, big height H, and a regular ring. And their conjecture is that if you take the H n symbolic power. Well, we know it's in the nth power for all n. That's the theorem we've been repeating. But they conjecture that maybe you can always add a power of n here. Maybe you can add h minus 1 times n. And I should say they made other conjectures um, that I can also say something about, but this is the one I want to focus on today. So if we did the trick we did before, took alphas on both sides, you know, divided, took limits, we would discover that this implies the conjecture when I have points. So in fact, you might wonder um, if, um, you might wonder if maybe there's a Shudnovsky like bound that's true more generally for your favorite, you know, radical ideal of big height H. And I think that, that um, appears in the literature in various forms. And for example, it is true for square free monomial ideals. Um, I think by various authors where they, for example, show how to compute the Valsmith constant for, for such ideals. 
So this is the conjecture I want to talk about. And I want to emphasize that this conjecture is stronger than the inequality, right? If I have the inequality, I don't get this containment. And this will tell me more. It will tell me actual information about the elements that live in this symbolic power besides their degrees. So in joint work with, uh, uh oh, in joint work with Senkin Obisui and Tai Ha and Tai Nguyen, um, we study this problem and we show that if you're in characteristic zero, if you're in, your n is at least three, and I emphasize n equals two, we already know anyways, but we actually need n equals three in our theorem. And if you have i defining s general points, so in an open set, and if s, um, we need a number of points to be big enough, we need it, actually, let me write it like this, we need the s to be at least four to the n, and I should say, um, we can improve the number of points bound. It could be two to the n if your n is at least nine. So in, in high dimensions, you know, the bound is smaller. But the idea is just take sufficiently many points. Um, there's an open set in the Hilbert scheme of S points in Pn where, first of all, the containment in this conjecture, and I'm sorry, I'm going to replace H by capital N because that's what H is. And so instead of little n, I'm going to write an R just to look different. So this is the containment that was conjectured by Harbour and Unicky. And we only prove that containment holds when R is large. But you might remember from a comment from earlier, if I'm studying bounds on degrees and bounds on the Schmidt constant, I only need the stable containment. And so as a consequence, we do get Harbour's, uh, we do get Shudnovsky's conjecture for these general sets of points. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about what we did, what's the strategy, and um, maybe I'll just say quickly, if you want something for any set of general points, so, so without you know, this condition on the sufficiently large, we do have this statement, but it's sort of one over and off from the right number, okay? Um, but there's, there's room to improve and I'll tell you where. And I also want to say that our theorem is really extending previous work um, by Luisa Fuli, Paulo Montero, and Yushi. This is 2018. And independently, so two independent papers prove the same result with different methods by Dumnitschke and Totaika Zinchka. Oops, okay, and this is uh, 2017. But this was, you know, they appeared about at the same time. And um, the statement is the following. They're in characteristic zero, they have an algebraically closed field, and their I defines S. And maybe I should say, in the Dumnitschke and Tataiga Zinchka paper, the S had to be at least two to the N, so similar to what we're doing for similar reasons. Um, but in the fully Montero sheet paper, they don't need um, any assumptions. So if it defines S very general points, they got the, um, so the fully Montero sheet paper directly proves Chudnovsky's inequality. The other paper actually gets the containment. But anyway, the containment is true between the, the two of them n minus one r, but they get it for all r. And so in particular, they get the Chudnovsky's conjecture. So all of i, it should be copy pasting these instead of writing them over and over. So I, I don't know that everyone's familiar with these notions of general versus very general. So first of all, I want to tell you what these mean. Um, so if you have some property, whatever it is, you say that it holds for S general points, if it holds on an open set in the Hilbert scheme of S points in Pn. So if, there, so if it holds for all X, so X is your set of points, 
in some open data set. Very general points is similar, um, but a little more restrictive. So that's very general points. If, let me just say, uh, holds for all X, not on an open set, but on an accountable intersection of some open sets. So really our work is in removing this countable intersection and getting an actual open set. And so I want to uh, give you a little sketch of the proof explaining the differences. How would you go from very general to general points and how this eventual stuff uh, comes about. So sketch, how do you go about proving things like this? Well, step one, instead of considering your points on PN, first you're going to consider generic points. So consider S generic points in PN. And let me remind us we're over fields K. So here's what I'm doing. So for each I, I have a point where I'm filling in the coordinates with variables. So I'm going to add a bunch of variables, these ZIJs. So now really I'm taking my field and I'm enlarging it. I'm adding all the variables that I added, right? One for each coordinate and every point. So S times M plus one variables. So first you're going to study these generic points. And I'm going to show that for generic points, um, let me cheat and let me copy paste this. This is the one advantage we have today, so I have to use it. Okay. So you're going to show your containment holds for generic points. Okay. Step two, you're going to specialize. So if you want to talk about, you know, your particular set of points in PN, you get it from the generic point by replacing all your variables by the actual things, right? So you get a specialization map and you would hope that when you specialize, you would preserve this containment you proved, but not quite. All you get is that for each containment, you're going to get an open dense set you are. where that containment is still true, okay? So where, and here I'm doing my trick, for each R, uh oh, this is now too big, let me make it small. I think we know what I mean, okay? And sorry for using the same letter, it's just faster to explain. This is just a sketch, I guess. So step three, I think we all know what I'm going, you take the intersection of all these guys for all the others, okay? And that's where your statement is true. So this is what you do for very general. Well, this is more or less what you would do, right? I'm sweeping tons of stuff under the rug, but just to give you an idea. If you wanna do this for general points, you start the same way. You're going to consider S generic points, but instead of proving something for all R, we're going to learn from that first project and we're going to find something for one R. So actually here's what I'm gonna do. For one R, I'm going to find, so for some R, I'm going to find an R that will depend just on the number of points I took. And I'm gonna show something a little stronger so that I'm deleting something. And maybe some of you are starting to, to feel like this looks like a familiar containment-ish. Step two, you specialize. You get an open dense set. where this one better, this, well, not one better, and better containment holds. And step three, you show that you're done. So you found one value, one special R, and you're going to show, well, at least, oh my God, I keep messing this up. So, Sankin il visoli, tai ha, tai nuyen and I, use the same tricks that I was talking about in the beginning. And we showed, um, actually, let, let me emphasize that we show something more general. I actually only has to be your favorite radical ideal of big height H in a regular. Okay. 
And we show that if there exists an R, such that now the HR minus H power is containing this guy, then the same statement is true um, stably. Sorry, these take a minute to write. So for all um, n large, you get the same thing. And you might um, notice that if I delete the powers of m, this is a theorem of mine I told you before. So it's actually the exact same technique. You can actually apply it to get this better, um, better containment. And now we're done. Because in our open set, we found this one containment was true. And that's enough to get the stable containment. And that's enough. Um, where to, uh, to do this. So um, let me finish by telling you a corollary of the two, the, so I put the two projects together and I didn't quite tell you the necessary results to put this together, but maybe you can see what the idea is. Um, so if you take I to be any set of general points, let me write S just to remind this. So now I don't need a lower bound, actually. I can still do what I wanted in PN. Then in fact, the resurgence of I is expected. And um, as a, in particular, of course, in particular, then stable harbor holds. But that stronger thing holds as well. So given any C, there is, given me C, this containment in R minus C contained in R is true for all large values. Okay. And of course, there's lots and lots to do still. Um, I do, before I finish, I do want to say though, the statements, so the, all the conditions, let me show you our theorem again. All the conditions in our theorem, the only reason we need these conditions is not because of the stable stuff, we needed to do this special step two. We needed to find that one value. So the statements about the numbers of points being large, the statements about the characteristic, all of it is only to find this value. And in particular, the theorem in step three, I think of it as sort of a strategy to attack the problem. So if you wanted to now go study your favorite set of ideals, or maybe, you know, if you're brave enough and you want to study any set of points, all you have to do is, you know, lots and lots of quotes around all because it's not that easy. But all you have to do is find one value where this is true. And then done. So I think uh, that's my time. So thank you. Okay. Um, if the the ideal, oh, sorry. I'm starting to answer the questions. Don't worry. All right. Well, uh, post them in the chat if you have additional questions, and I guess Eloisa will read them. I'm going to try to read them. It's, it's a little tricky. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, Here's a question yeah. uh, to say verbally. A different measure of how far I is from, or I to the N is from I to the symbolic N, would be by measuring what denominators you need. So, for example, if I take an element F in the non-completed dissection locus, of i, and when I invert f, they all become equal. Uh, and you could ask, as n grows, how the power of f that you need to multiply i to the n by grows, and whether that's anything nice. If it grew linearly, I think then the symbolic ring would be finitely generated. I didn't think about that for very long, but something like that is true. Um, David, I think. If f works to multiply, you can get an f that multiplies so that f to the n multiplies i symbolic n into i to the n. Yeah. But, but that's not enough to imply that the symbolic power algebra is finally generated. You can, you can always do that. You don't even know that it, some power is going to send higher symbolic powers. And, uh, no, that was the linear case that, that Huckster answered. But um, I think it was Mel. But yeah, yeah. I guess if it's constant, you're okay. If one power does it, mm -hmm. that can't happen. And that can't happen. I see. Well, unless they're equal. 
So, so a related question that's quite open is uh, getting a, some kind of polynomial bound for the number of generators of the uh, nth symbolic power, mm -hmm. uh, let's say in the local case. Right. There are very limited results about that. The general case is wide open. Yeah. As far as I know. I think Long Dow and Jonathan Montaño have some recent results of this kind. Yes. You're really uh, trying to apply, you know, when that happens to, to, to get other nice, nice things. But yeah, I think, I, I think one thing that's true about symbolic powers is that most questions you could ask are, are probably open. Um, I, I think I've heard Mel say this is a theorem before. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, I believe it. Um, yeah, so there's a question, sorry, here in the well, chat. That's Girdle's theorem. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's Girdle's theorem in some sense. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. But I think most reasonable questions one would ask uh, are, are, you know, questions that sound, I think it's easy to ask a question that sounds innocent and easy, and then it's, it's not. Um, anyway, so let me, let me answer this question from the chat. Um, they're asking about mixed characteristics. Um, so I was a, a little coy with which things need, uh, need a containing a field or not. So let me tell you this, this, uh, when I started the second half of the talk, I was essentially assuming that I was containing a field. Although I'll say this, this theorem, the technique that I use, I was really using a result of, uh, of, uh, Johnson, a generalization of the Anders Feld, Smith and Hofstra Unicke, uh, results. Um, and, and the, the, the statement of his that I was using in his paper requires that your ring contains a field. Now, um, a while back with uh, Carl, we, we showed that what you need in mixed characteristic is also true. And so the same statement holds, and so you can copy the idea. But I confess this is not in the literature anywhere. That's really my fault. Um, so I shouldn't claim that as a theorem. But I believe this does not need mixed characteristic. Now, what else might need here? I have, they're, they're, I should say this is quite technical. There are various ideas that go into this theorem and there are different ways um, where we need to contain a field. So to disentangle precisely where, you know, what are the steps you would need to, to, to check where it can make characteristic, um, that would need me, would take me some time to think about it. I don't know if, maybe since Craig is here, I don't know if he wants to make any comments about that. I don't know anything. Yeah. So, so I mean, in general, the mixed characteristic setting is, is much harder. That's why it took so long for for Carl and, for for Carl and Trump to to prove this, this theorem. That's from just a few years ago. Well, the most things are. We were also using some other people's work, like you know Andre and Peter yeah. and stuff You're like using that. Using perfect techniques. Yeah. And it needed the perfect techniques. Yeah. yeah. That's that's true. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. If, did I miss any questions in the chat that I should answer? There, there were a couple other ones. Um, yeah, so I did it. Oh, go ahead. Well, there, there was one about, um, just in the last five minutes, there was a question about, can you always find open dense sets? And of the talk. Um, um, in general, if you have some statement, so, If you have a statement like this, there's always there's an open dense set where you're going to preserve it because there's an open dense set where you're going to preserve products um, or, or products go inside products. Uh, there's a, an open dense set where you're going to preserve. So like for a statement like this, uh, where am I? Yeah, to make something like this, um, you need to take the intersection of a couple of finitely many different sets, like two or three, you know, the ones where you, you um, preserve the power, where the symbolic power will land inside, it will, will be preserved as well. Um, so I think, I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, there was another question. Um... Motivation by dividing by n. So, um, I confess, I'm not an, I'm not an expert on Janowski's conjecture. Um, 
And in fact, there might be some people here who know, who know more about it uh, than me, but for me, in this particular statement, it appears to me to be a natural thing to do from the containments that I know, right? From, you might remember, let me see if I find the place where I did the containment. Uh, earlier with this is computation. Earlier we did this computation and we were using this containment. So, you know, in general, I guess Swanson already told us we had some linear relations like this in, in big generality. So it, it seems uh, natural to me to do this, but it, maybe they're asking dividing by N here and not capital N. If they mean by dividing by N, um, well, first of all, I would expect that the bounds should depend on N in some sense. Um, I don't know that it's most natural that it appears as, as a, you know, a linear function of n, um, but um, to define this Waldschmidt constant, I needed to divide by n, right, to know that I had this. But I think there are probably better answers to the question than, than this one. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know what exactly what Waldschmidt's uh, uh, motivation was. Maybe someone has a better answer than me. Okay, um, if not, if there's no more questions, it looks like things have sort of calmed down there. Why don't we all thank Eloisa again? Um, and uh, David, did you have a link you wanna share here for the breakout room as well? I do. So I think uh, that, let's get to the bottom of this, that this is the right link. Um, so if you want to come and join everybody and chat a bit, Louisa, can you come and join us for a while? Absolutely, I'll be there. So if you want to ask me more questions, um, if you're not satisfied with my answer so far, you have more questions, I'll be happy to talk more about them. Yeah.